This is MFG Out Loud. Courageous conversations about sales and marketing for today's manufacturers. With your hosts, Ray Zaganto and Allison DeFore. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of MFG Out Loud. We're so glad that you're joining us today and spending some time. We want to bring you value, education, expertise, and exposure in 30 minutes. And today will uh, be no letdown. I can tell you that we have got Lori Tappany from Wyoming Machine joining us. She is a veteran manufacturer with a I think, a really incredible story. So without further ado, Lori, thank you for being on the podcast. Allison and Ray, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Just the time that you and I spent about a month ago together um, doing a FaceTime call and just me being with you in person for the first time after being connected for all these years. I appreciate you inviting me to be, be here today. Well, uh, it's my pleasure. And it's, it, again, this is the beauty, I think, Ray and I talk about this all the time, the beauty of LinkedIn and the beauty of social media. And I connected with you and your sister, Tracy, gosh, a number of years ago. And then when I was working on the Face of Manufacturing project, uh, I interviewed you and her and really just it was part of the reason that I'm such a fan of featuring females in manufacturing, because I feel like, well, doesn't everybody know about the Tappany sisters? And as it turns out, I would share with people and they're like, no, who are they? And I thought people need to know. So, (laughs) you know, and like you said, then we finally connected after several years. And even though we still have not met face to face have created, I think a really neat um, start to a friendship and, and built a relationship. So thank God for LinkedIn and, uh, and for virtual, right? Yeah. And, and one of the things I find is that I'm really skilled at meeting people virtually, whether it's LinkedIn or some other forum, or even if it's an in-person seminar, I will know almost instantly that person's going to be my friend. You know, yeah. there's just yeah. something. So that's kind of great. Yeah, well, your instincts were spot on with me and mine with you. And um, still, so, to, still not sure about me, but that's, that's uh, <laughs> the jury's still out on Ray. <laughs> no, but would you tell our listeners a little bit about Wyoming Machine so they know what the heck you guys do? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Wyoming Machine Precision Metal Fabrication. So um, I'm excited to be with you. This is a manufacturing podcast, so I'm sure. Uh, Many listeners know um, what contract fabricators do. So we are, by and large, working with other manufacturers, uh, building product to their specifications. And we have uh, the good fortune to have built wonderful customer relationships over the years. And some of our first customers, um, we have worked with them our entire existence since 1974 when we were founded. So that's really exciting. The, the, the work that we do is, is very diverse, highly engineered products. We work with um, people that build, you know, custom packaging equipment, for example. So the things that we're doing, very uh, high mix, lower volume. We're not making a million pieces of anything. Uh, Products change, develop, um, improve. And so a lot of our customers have the expectation that, you know, if they want to make an improvement, wherever we are in the production process, we need to be nimble and we need to make those changes. So we're in defense, uh, we're in aerospace, we're in custom packaging, all kinds of other really cool, um, pieces of equipment that do different things. Um, Several years ago, you may remember the show ER. Um, One of the products we make for a customer was on the the set on the front desk of ER. And and people were always excited when it came to Thursday night and they could tell their whole family, we made that. So um, yes, so that's a little bit about Wyoming Machine. We're second generation metal fabrication company. And my sister and I are in our 27th year. 
of owning the company. So um, our transition story is very unique. And I'm, I'm surprised at how many people continue to ask about, you know, how it came to be that we became the second generation owners. It's, it's a fun story. Well, and I would love to unpack that a little bit because I too think it's a really cool story. I know when I asked your sister, um, and like I said, a number of years ago, did you choose manufacturing or did it choose you? So would you share a little bit? Cause I think you, and you both had a similar experience, obviously. Absolutely. Um, so the way that this came to be, um, we had an unusual upbringing. We're a total all girl family. So, uh, there's three, three of us. So I have two sisters and, uh, we were off doing our careers. Um, I became a CPA, Tracy and I both went to business school and she was in international trade finance. I was working for a client and I was in the healthcare industry and our father had owned Wyoming machine since 1974. So this was in the early nineties and he was meeting with advisors to kind of think about his future succession. And when they asked him, you know, what he thought would be a good plan, you know, do you want to sell your company? Is there someone internally to buy it? Uh, they asked him and his pie in the sky, perfect thing that he thought is that his girls should run the company. And it's funny because Tracy and I are 13 months apart in age. And so we went through our life like as a unit, not like Lori and Tracy. It was like the girls and Sherry. So the interesting thing is um, we were off living in the city and doing our careers. He didn't want us to feel like we had to do it. Like if your dad asks you to do this, it's a requirement. So we were invited to a meeting at a law office with insurance agents, accountants, um, and, you know, estate planning attorneys, and he didn't go to the meeting. And so we just knew it had something to do with business. And they, you know, shared with us that his dream would be that we would want to do it. And we were in our, you know, mid twenties and, I think it took us probably about two days and we we're like, yeah, we want to do this. This is, this is going to be great. Um, he was excited. He told us that the company ran itself and that it was going to be really, really easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I can remember, you know, going back and when we, you know, shared this with the people that we were working with, you know, a lot of people were horrified that we were going to go to manufacturing. They're like, oh my gosh, you're going to be in this little tiny town with, you know, it's going to be dirty and it's going to be, you know, blue collar workers and you're not going to have any engaging conversations. And, and how could you make a decision that that was that terrible? And um, we made that decision and we never looked back. And I think the really unique part of the story that a lot of entrepreneurs and, you know, founders don't do this. We only worked with our dad for three years. So um, we came in, we met, um, he was very adamant about the fact that we were a team and that, you know, we didn't want to create an environment where someone could go to him and get one answer that they didn't like, and then come to me and get a different answer that we were going to be a unified team. And he just stopped coming to work. Like he didn't come to work for a couple of years and, you know, we didn't want to hurt his feelings. And one day, you know, we were like, dad, are you ever coming back to work? And he's like, no, I retired. Do you want to party? No, I don't want to party. So, um, so I think that people, a lot of people find that interesting and he never we're a very close family. We do a ton of stuff together outside of work. And when he left, he never asked us one thing about it. Never asked any questions about work. So that is unique. That is Extraordinary. complete trust, <laughs> oh right? In your abilities. And that's how he raised you to, because um, I happen to know the backstory is that he didn't raise you like, you know, as a gender 
per se, like, oh, your girls, it was, you guys, we can do, you can do anything. And that's absolutely true. And I, I really, I, I felt strongly. And a lot of times people would say after we joined the company, like, I bet your dad's sad. He never had a son. And it's like, oh. no, he's not. <laughs> that's, that's not wow. true. He's not sad. Um, you know, he's a pretty stoic guy. He's a Marine and once a Marine, always a Marine. Um, and, but he really instilled that you can do anything you want. And I think that this is unique in that um, we could do anything, try anything we wanted to try growing up. But one of the things is that he really stressed the importance of us taking any available science and math. He really believed that STEM was the future. And, you know, he's like, I don't care if you, you know, want to be an artist, but I want you to take math and science. And so um, I grew up, I was my class artist. I have always been an artist, but I was really good at math. So I went to business school and got a degree in accounting. Um, And, you know, I think that's largely due to my dad and mom stressing STEM, even back in that era. He was way ahead of his time with that. Yes. Truly. And if um, I don't want to hog things, Ray, so I'll give you a second or a chance in a minute. Um, I would wonder if you would share with the listeners, and and I I think it's a good transition or segue from you talking about, you know, the people saying, oh, don't, I bet your dad wishes he had a son. When you and um, Tracy came and started running the company, it's my understanding that you guys tried to run it the way you thought dad would have run it or the way maybe a guy would run it or, you know, and then realized you needed to be who you were as leaders and lead your way. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, joining the company, I think in the beginning, the strangeness was more external to the company. Um, you know, we had some, you know, things happen that were just, when I look back on it, I can't even believe that that happened. Granted, it was a long time ago, but we went to California to a machine uh, tool trade show. You know, we buy a lot of heavy duty equipment and we were raised like we can do anything. We can go any place. Well, we went to a cocktail reception the day before the show started. And it was a weird venue where you came in on one level and then you went downstairs and then it, the, the event was happening on the lower level. And when we came in and started coming down the stairs, um, our salesperson from Minnesota shouted, hey, everybody, the blondes are mine. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, when you were raised like we were raised like that would never be something that you would want to hear. Um, And, you know, so I think when we first came in, we were implementing our first network system. And because of the backgrounds we had with, you know, finance and business schools, we were very well suited to do an implementation like that. And because we're in a small community, the employees at our company were very excited to have us. And, you know, I knew these people. I, you know, here's a guy who's never touched a computer in his life. I can remember going to the hardware store and buying enamel paint and like painting some of the keys, like his tab, like, okay, Ron, here's where you just hit the pink key and you're good. Um, And, but, you know, externally, it's like sheet metal fabrication had its own, you know, aura. And it was like, we were kind of stifled is what I would say of thinking, how are we going to fit in? I mean, sheet metal fabrication in this day and age probably only has 5% women in it. So imagine back then. And so that was, you know, that was difficult. Um, But it was definitely a huge turning point when we realized, you know, we need to come from this, you know, from a place of authenticity, like, we can't follow in the footsteps of the way people are doing things if it's not the way that we genuinely would do it. So imagine a sheet metal fabrication shop in 
the 90s, company-wide, we read, and when I say read, we had audio books, large print books, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. We created, um, you know, our guiding principles of the way that we wanted to work with each other. And we um, did consulting on problem solving because that's the background we came from. You know, I worked on audit teams when I was in public accounting with men and women, and I never gave it a single thought of, you know, working together and, and solving problems. So, you know, we really, um, I think, flourished when we went, wow, we can do sheet metal fabrication the way we want to do it. Yeah. So awesome. I th- there, you really hit on something, and I think it's th- that authenticity, you know, finding or giving yourself permission to be authentic in, in how you're going to approach it and everything else. Because employees can see through that. Just like, you know, Alice and I talk about this all the time, just like bad marketing. You know, you can pick up real quick if if you're being shown something that you know doesn't really exist, you know. But internally, that, that whole culture thing, you're never going to build a solid culture uh, and be an effective leader and, and, and develop a real rapport with your team. If the culture is just posters on the wall, you know, they, they've got to pick up on it. Like you took the time and effort to go buy the enamel to paint the keys. You know, it wasn't a matter of, you know, you idiot, how come you don't know that? I don't care. <laughs> let's, we, let's, let's solve the problem, you know, and right. doing that together uh, speaks volume to volumes to your, uh, I think what's, what's brought you here today. And uh, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. One of the, one of the things I, and I, uh, I always do my homework and I, and I, I, I jump in. So I, I did lots of research and got on the website and looked around and I got to know whose side of the family is aunt mag on. Um, that is our maternal side. So, okay. um, and the interesting thing about aunt Meg is um, I had not seen her in 30, you know, she moved to the East Coast and, and yeah. lived her life out there in, in Boston and in Florida. And um, I, last year at exactly this time, I had a board meeting in Texas. And then I, uh, Trace and I are on the U.S. Chamber Small Business Council. And we had a meeting in Miami. Mm-hmm. I took the weekend in between those two meetings and I went. I was the last family member to see her. Mm-hmm. I spent the weekend with her. And she's just the most fascinating woman ever. And I'm so glad that I shared that on LinkedIn because so many people reached out to me. It's, it's such a, 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 a beautiful story and so, it certainly speaks to your, uh, I mean, it's, it's in your genes. I mean, you might've, you might've started out in, in a, in a different path. Uh, but you've, uh, I, I think you've, you've found the one you were destined to be on and, and just learning that story. Cause my, my father was kind of of that generation and, and, you know, World War II veteran, you know, type thing. And just, just her story and how, you know, her attitude and everything, that's, that's somebody, everybody wishes they had that, that Aunt Mag in their, uh, in their lineage somewhere, but what a, what a beautiful story. And thank you for sharing that with everybody. I, I appreciate it. My, um, she was my grandpa's sister and my grandfather was a commercial fisherman on Lake Superior. So for wow. his life. Um, so he was a very, very hardworking person. And just mm-hmm. to, to connect those two things is that, you know, part of, of growing up the way that we did, you know, we got to do everything. You know what I mean? So I'm just as qualified to host a wonderful dinner party and do all the cooking as whipping out a chainsaw and cutting down a tree at my cabin. Like we did <laughs> everything. You know what I mean? And we still do. We yeah. still do. My dad's 81 and we're still falling trees in the North woods of Wisconsin. So it's awesome. <laughs> well, so. and you know, <clears throat> I believe your family has kind of a personal slash professional motto and it's the Finnish word is Sisu. Sisu. Yes. Tenacity yeah. of purpose. We, we don't really have an equivalent, but you know, if you've got Sisu, like you go for it and you don't stop until you achieve it. Like when I was a kid, I would arm wrestle with my dad and I, I probably would fight it. And just till I was purple in my face, like I'm going to win. And I know if I just keep trying 
and everyone in my family has that. It's so funny. That's funny. I love it. It runs deep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. What have you, what have you seen? Uh, I mean, nobody's, nobody's journey, any, everybody in manufacturing has, has seen the, the ups and downs, uh, you know, and, and they, 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 they look the same for a while and then along comes a COVID or, uh, or, or something like that. What are, what do you attribute your uh, re resilience to, or was that something you you learned along the way, or was that always kind of part of the, the business DNA? How do you, how do you cope with the ups and downs within the organization? I think, you know, that over time, you know, the more times that you butt up against adversity and hard times, mm -hmm. you know, you get through it and then you look back and you're like, we did that. And so, you know, if you really look at it, we've all 100% of the time made it through mm. something that happened that was really hard because we wouldn't be here if we didn't. And I think each one is a little bit different. You know, when I think of 9-11, mm. um, you know, and what that did, you know, to business um, and just kind of like, like the dot-com bubble, you know, mm. there were all kinds of customers, you know, around that new technology. Uh, that was difficult. Um, I think being diverse in, in the customers that we work mm -hmm. with, when it was the 2008, 2009, we had our second highest year ever in revenue. Yeah. So we came into that and right as our commercial customers were, were really suffering, mm -hmm. um, we got a defense contract. And, oh. you know, I think oh. a unique thing about that was, um, we got that because we were collaborative. So mm -hmm. we, it was a contract that's so big that we couldn't do it all. And one of our proposals was to collaborate with some other people that might be competitors with us. And the customer thought that that was so wonderful that they gave us the contract and let us decide how much of it we wanted to do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think, I think that um, just making through it, COVID definitely unlike anything I've ever seen. And, um, you know, I shared with Allison earlier, you know, I think the piece that's different is I'm an empty nester. I live by myself to just be in a super intense situation at my work and then to come home and, and just not be able to see people and go mm -hmm. any place was a little bit hard. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. whole sense of connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah, it took a toll. And um, I think that's one of the things that Ray and I have seen in, especially with the number of podcasts that we've done this last year, is the effects too on salespeople and having to switch. And a buddy of ours, Mark Roberts, um, he talks about the research that shows that like what 60% Ray of salespeople are not equipped or good at selling online. And yeah, vir virtually they don't know what to do. Yeah. yeah. And so they're really treading water. And so, and God, unfortunately we're getting close to our time being up regarding that. Could you share a little bit about, you know, there were a lot of manufacturers that froze like a deer in the headlights during last year, uh, waiting to see what was going to happen, waiting for things to get back to normal. What advice do you have um, for manufacturers, small manufacturers who kind of got stuck in that mindset? And I don't know. I, I feel like they're, they're going to get left far behind or do you have some thoughts and opinion on that? You know, I, when I look at it, I'm not sure if you guys have participated in the, the Gallup strengths finder, um, mm. the mm. assessment that you could do. Yeah. And so like, when I think of what my top five are, you know, it's, it's influencing and relationship building, um, problem solving, um, but my number one is woo. So like, I'm that person, like I want to be places and I want to meet people and find out about them. And 
Um, I think that, you know, you can't just put everything on pause. You have to move forward. And staying connected with your customers um, is critical. Using every technology, you know, that you possibly can. You know, what I've noticed is um, people that you might normally have a phone conversation with, it's actually enhanced if you can do a video call with them. So that has been happening. And I think also recognizing that we're human beings. We're not just business to business robots trying to sell stuff. Like we're connected to our customers. I'm connected to my customers. And, you know, during this time, it's okay to, you know, share things. I got an aeroponic garden system this year and and I'm growing crops in my kitchen. And the number of customers that want to find out about that and they want to know, you know, where I got it, you know, what I'm doing and, you know, they could be sharing things. So I just feel, you know, that just recognizing that you can't put your connections to your customers on hold because of a pandemic. Yeah. Well, and I think the thing that you brought up just now, that's just absolutely paramount is that I think the face of manufacturing is definitely changing and uh, not just the female aspect, which I dig, but I think everybody realized this last year, what you just said is we're all just people, you know? And if, and if you're like all of a sudden, I feel like some, some, walls were, were let down, some guards were let down, which was really nice to really connect with people on a, on a deeper level. And yes. that's been an exciting thing for me to witness in manufacturing. Do you, have you felt the same? I, I have absolutely felt the same way. And I think that, you know, one of the other things that I've noticed over these years is um, recognizing that, you know, there's me and there's my customers, but at a higher level, we, we share some common problems, you know, and challenges like around workforce. And so, you know, if I'm out in the world promoting manufacturing, promoting manufacturing to women, helping, you know, the skilled labor shortage issues, that's a way that I'm partnering with my customer. I'm not I'm a partner with you in the whole big picture of manufacturing. And I think that that's a really wonderful thing to do too. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm we got to wrap up Ray. I'm just no, checking. I, I, do you have I, one more I, question? I, I, snuck, I snuck my great aunt mag question in early. just in case. <laughs> so that, that was the one I wanted to get to. So I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> well, I have one last question. Do you, what do you feel like the future of manufacturing looks like? And that's a really big, broad question in terms of, I'm going to, I'm going to, of course, shift this to a marketing perspective question. Do you feel like the nature of manufacturing marketing is definitely um, turned to being more, you know, emotionally engaging? and down to earth and even even in a digital way i I absolutely 100 percent agree you know when we started out you know with digital marketing pieces it was okay we have to write a super technical white paper you know we're going to hire a writer we're going to talk about how we can weld reservoirs and you know do this with aluminum and you know people read it And then what we noticed was when we share a workforce story about um, a man that came to us through the pastor in town because he and his family had been through, you know, a really, really tough time and found themselves homeless and a family of four living in a vehicle. Can you hire him? Okay. We brought him on. He was a custodian part-time, expressed an interest in moving into production, uh, we have the ability to offer four credit classes internally. He has grown and developed, and now he operates a laser in our company and has, you know, a, a wonderful job, you know, a career that, you know, sustains his family. And that resonates with people. I've received messages from potential customers that have said, 
I want to do business with you. Uh, mm. I'm, I don't know when the right project, but you are exactly the kind of company I want to work with that would do that. So definitely be open to, you know, sharing things that are, you know, from a place of authenticity, that's helping the workforce, that's helping the world, and it's going to resonate with people. Yeah. Wow. L- live your truth and uh, your, your people will find you, <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. That's, yep. that's amazing. And manufacturing wholeheartedly. Yeah. I think you and your sister and your family are the epitome of that. So Thank you so much. We think you're pretty darn cool. <laughs> I think you're cool too. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Ray, do you want to tell people how they can uh, stay connected with us? And- I would love to tell people how they can stay connected with us. We are so thrilled and honored. And again, Lori, thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing your story. What a what a continuing inspiration uh, you are to the manufacturing community. So thank you for that. To our wonderful listeners, if you liked what you heard today, and we know you did, admit it. Uh, please hit the like button. If you really liked it, please follow us and subscribe and uh, all kinds of cool, good things will happen as a result. (laughs) But uh, we would sure love to have you uh, keep following us here at MFG Out Loud and, uh, uh, and, and stick around for more. So there will be more. And hey, everybody, we want you to keep manufacturing out loud because we need you. You. Until next time. Thank you for listening to MFG Out Loud with Ray Zaganto and Allison DeFore. You can subscribe and find show notes at mfgoutloud.com.